Good evening, everybody. My name is Doug Mitchell. I have the great privilege of serving as the executive director of the Glacier National Park Conservancy. I'm joined tonight by my partners in crime from the Glacier Conservancy, uh, Grace Kinsler, uh, Andrew Smith, and Amy Lucky. Amy's going to be monitoring the chat. We really want this to be a conversation or perhaps more tonight than in other nights because unfortunately, um, we lost a, a great legend when, um, when Carol Guthrie passed. Um, and so she, of course, um, uh, left, a, left a legacy with her writing and also a legacy with the people with whom she worked. And I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to reach out to uh, Will and to Anne and, uh, earlier, I guess, late last year and ask if they would um, agree to, to talk to us a, a, about the book and about the work that they did with Carol um, and then the work in general of, of what it's like to, to publish in Glacier. Um, so um, it's really a treat for me to, to have um, these professionals tonight. A little about both of them. Anne is a writer and researcher who lives right here in West Glacier, um, where she came to know and work with uh, Carol C.W. Guthrie. Um, and in 2017, in fact, Anne and her husband, Dan, co-authored with Guthrie the book Death and Survival in Glacier National Park, True Tales of Tragedy, Courage, and Misadventure. And Anne is joining us today from a vac family vacation. Thank you so much, Anne, for doing that from Ojai, California. Thanks for being with us, Anne. Look, very much. And, and Will Harmon uh, is joining us from uh, the Queen City of the Rockies. Uh, for those of you not familiar, that would be, of course, Helena. Um, he has been a backcountry guide, a wilderness ranger, and also an accomplished writer in his own right. Um, he serves as the senior editor at Far Country Press, the award-winning publisher of, of First Rangers, uh, and also a number of other books. Um, uh, we're really proud partners with Far Country Press, who, when you come to our uh, store at Belton or in any of the, of the visitor centers in the park, you will see a lot of Far Country uh, titles. So, uh, Will, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Glad to be here, Doug. And, and Carol, just a little, you know, Carol Guthrie, who wrote this book and others, died in 2019, just weeks after the re-release of First Rangers, which was, um, uh, she was 82 years old. And, uh, you know, it was really, um, it was the first book, I think, that Carol wrote about Mon Montana. And she left, has, left us quite a legacy uh, with her work here in Montana. You know, I, I want to start with you, Anne, if I could, and, and just um, have you kind of you know, talk us through the first time that you met Carol, if, if memory serves. I think you may have been working at the archives at the time. Tell us a little about how you met and what your impression was and where, where that led. Well, the first impression is still very vivid for me. Um, I didn't meet Carol until she had already written two books, The First Rangers, and she had also written All Aboard for Glacier, which was published by Far Country Press. But she visited the archives and wanted to do history research on the Going to the Sun Road, which she was gonna write a book about that and Far Country Press was going to publish that book as well. So I was working as a museum tech and uh, in the Glacier National Park Archives. And one of my primary responsibilities was to assist researchers. And I walked into the research room and Carol was standing up and she had her laptop on the research table open in front of her. Her hands were on her hips and her long red hair was draping over her shoulders. And she had a broad smile on her face. Um, she was also uh, dressed impeccably in Western attire, of course. And I remember thinking to myself, well, this woman is a class act. And I also remember thinking she means business. And she did mean business. She was really organized. She knew precisely what she needed to research. And we just had the best time when she was working on this book. So um, it wasn't um, too long after that when she was visiting the archives again. And this time she was working on writing the book about Glacier's Centennial, which was the first 100 years, which Far Country Press was also going to publish. And this was a 
quite involved and spanned many months. And she had many visits into the archives, but we just took up where we left off. And, and um, I got all sorts of requests from her and we found all sorts of fun facts and photos. And that was another very pleasant time with her. Um, and that's After a remarkable, that that, that's, from, that's really a remarkable, the 100 years book oh, is yeah. really a remarkable accomplishment, isn't it? It is. And uh, it was, it's concise, but has so much information in it that it was, I think she really enjoyed working on that book a lot. Um, but after the first 100 years, she departed from writing about Glacier and she wrote a book about the Pony Express. And I became her contract researcher for that book. And that helped me grow as a researcher because I needed to tap museums and archives and libraries all over the US and National Archives, the Library of Congress, New York Public Library. And there's even a Pony Express Museum in San Francisco. Mm. <laughs> so, so that was another enjoyable project. And then we, we launched a pretty ambitious project, which we collaborated with Monica Youngster, who owns Montana House in Apgar Village. And we called this our community history project. And the goal was to interview people that had a connection to McDonald Valley and do oral histories. And we also wanted to interview people in surrounding communities that had uh, connections to Glacier, like in West Glacier or Lake Five. And um, by that took several years. And by the end of that time, we had collected way more than 30 interviews of very interesting people and stories. So with all these projects, our friendship just evolved and grew and um, we became very close. And then of course, the, the last project I had the privilege of working with her on was writing Death and Survival in Glacier National Park. Yeah, that's terrific. What, a, what an interesting adventure from a chance encounter, right? You're, exactly. you're at the archives, you don't know who's walking in, and all of a sudden you end up with, a, with um, one of those things. It's one of those kismet situations where uh, you develop a lifelong friendship from something, right? Exactly. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. So, um, I want to follow up, I, and I'm going to try and do, um, uh, Andrew has generously trusted me with technology tonight, and I'm going to try uh, briefly and share my screen Anne, and show a photograph that you sent us, um, he says very confidently. Um, this will be impressive. Bing and Mary um, will, um, will be impressed in Pittsburgh if I can pull this off. So I'm told that there's a story behind this, Anne Fagri. Oh, yeah. Well, the photo does speak for itself pretty well, but uh, I recalled this photo from the archives when I was reading chapter five in First Rangers. It was a spell over the land, and it told the story of uh, Fred Herrig marrying Frida, and then we learn about Frank marrying Lulu and all the other single rangers, miners, uh, loggers, and settlers that were thinking they needed a life companion too. So um, I, I just, this is actually a pretty famous photo from the archives, but I'm, I was interested when I reread the, the credits for it is that the two men on the left were actually Bill Dowks and Frank Goodoon, and they are mentioned in the book quite often. And uh, Bill is on page 55 with a photo, and uh, there's a story of him traveling with Liebig to put out a fire up the North Fork in between Bowman and Quartz Creek, and it was a slog. And they, uh, finally reach where this fire is. And uh, as people have read, there's a huge thunderstorm and it puts the fire out. So one of my favorite quotes from Liebig is this. He said, we didn't say much, but we thought a lot. 
nothing pleasant either. So <laughs> I thought that was really amusing. But Gadoon, who um, is, is the book says was one of the founding settlers of Apgar and later moved to the head of the lake. Well, Liebig's narrative on page 44 talks about the Cree, Herrig, and me uh, around 1902 or 1903. And they actually took Frank Gadoon along on that horseback ride to confront the Cree. So they were definitely compatriots then. And then when I was reading the glossary, here comes Gadoon again. Uh, he actually had a little bit to do with the naming of Mount Stanton. Um, Mount Stanton was named for Lottie Stanton, who in 1891 outclimbed some guests of guide Frank Gadoon. And she reached the top of the peak that now bears her name before the rest of the, of the party. So he just keeps cropping up and we even have him in our death and survival book. <laughs> So. Which and when we put a link in the chat for those interested in in Anne and Dan and, and Carol's book, we put a link uh, in the chat that'll take you right to the page at glacier.org to acquire said book. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. So is Joe Cosley in that photo? No, he's not. The other two men are two Apgars, Milo and someone else. Uh, let's see here. It would be. Um, Cosley only makes a brief appearance in the book at Memory Serves, and um, you know that's a whole nother the the Joe Cosley story is a whole nother story for a whole nother night. But uh, yeah. but clearly they at least in intersected during their time in the in the region, right? And I've always wondered who was behind the camera on that photo because the hmm. dates line up 1901-1902. It could have been Frank or Fred. And but I don't think we'll ever know, but I like to think it would have been one of them. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. That's a great photo, a great story. Thanks for sharing that with us, Anne. So, Will, I, I want to turn to you. Uh, yeah, can Will, I, go ahead. The, the reason that Joe Cosley isn't in that photo is he didn't have any problem finding a woman <laughs> or them finding him. <laughs> He was kind of known as a ladies' man, so I, I'm I'm told that the legend goes that there are a few lakes, perhaps named after uh, uh, after uh, young ladies who were that was their consolation prize. <laughs> well, that makes sense. So, Will, I wanted to turn to you, and you know, kind of get a get a sense from you about where and how your relationship with Carol. Um, began and how that relationship, I would think that it probably differs from researcher, partner, from editor. So kind of talk us about, to about how did you guys meet? How did you get to know each other? And what was that relationship like? Sure. Um, and it, it may not have been quite as different as you'd suspect, but uh, I knew Carol through her books that we published at Far Country. So I was familiar um, with her work, if not her. And then um, someone at Far Country, uh, and probably our publisher, Lyndon Hatcher, thought it would be a good idea to do uh, a book, Death in Glacier National Park, um, modeled after the Death in Yellowstone by Lee Whittlesey. Uh, that's a very popular book, uh, a, a good selling book in Yellowstone. And so um, we, we thought about who should write it and Carol's name you know, instantly popped to the top. And, and uh, I, I got to call her, kind of cold call her, <laughs> and ask if she'd be interested. Unfortunately, it was only about two years uh, after her husband, Joe, had passed away. And, and I didn't know that at the time, but Carol was sort of hesitant, and I didn't know why. Uh, and, and so we talked about the project some. I gave her kind of a sense of the scope of it. And then she called me back a week or two later, and uh, and she told me, she said, you know, I, I, I feel like I just lost my husband. It's been two years, but I'm not sure I'm ready to write about a whole book about death. And, and I said, well, I understand. And we ended up just talking for a while. And, and through that and, and other conversations with her, uh, we kind of hit it off. We clicked. We, we discovered certain things in common, and it was easy to do with Carol, uh, but, but we found out, you know, her husband was a, a career uh, military officer, my father was, 
Um, her husband's middle name was Aloysius. Uh, my dad had an uncle named Aloysius, not, not a name you hear often today. <laughs> uh, it, it's a Saint Aloysius who is uh, um, actually a, a patron saint of taking care of people during a pandemic. He, he actually died uh, wow. caring for sick people during a pandemic. And, and uh, apparently Aloysius is a fairly, or used to be a popular name uh, in, with people of Irish heritage. Uh, so so in, in talking with Carol, we, we did kind of hit it off. She kind of eventually came around to thinking, mm, yeah, I can, I can maybe take this book on and, and uh, it'll be worth doing. And, and then not long after she signed the contract, she thought, this is a lot of work <laughs> and I'm going to need some help. So she had the, the brilliant idea of asking Anne and Dan to join on as co-authors. And I don't remember, Anne, you, you, you may be able to help me out here, but at some point, and I think it was before you might have even signed the contract, you, you and Dan came up with the idea of saying, well, let's make it death and survival in Glacier. So it's stories about near misses, close calls and, and rescues. And, well, and, and after that, we brainstormed to see how this book could stand out from the rest of the books being written about deaths in national parks. And, and uh, so after she proposed going to survival stories to people at Far Country and they said, sure, she was much more enthusiastic about the book yes. project after that. Yeah, that, I think it really did help make a difference. And it also... I mean, all four of us sort of bonded over this idea that now the book could, could have some suspense. You wouldn't start a story knowing how it ended, right? right. If they're all people, just stories people about live people to tell about it. Right, yeah. So, um, and then I, I, I did uh, work with Carol on one other book. She was uh, hired as a ghostwriter um, for Bernice Endy's book, Lady Longrider, about riding horseback solo. Uh, 30,000 miles plus uh, across North America. And, and Carol being a horsewoman uh, was, was sort of the perfect person for that. And of course she and Bernice ended up becoming great friends as well. Uh, that was just Carol. Um, so, and, and the, the other thing I, I found out in talking with Carol is that she'd written this, this book, her first book first, and she called it First Ranger. Um, she said she was she got so busy with working on the book that she didn't stop to think that maybe it should be plural rangers since there were two rangers in the in the book uh, but she'd published it uh, self-published it actually through red wing publishing a, a publishing company she started just to publish the book and there's a line on the first page of first rangers um, that that says uh, frank Leibig was not a man to do things by half and it didn't take me long to realize that, that that same quality applied to Carol as well. You know, most people, when they think, I'm, I want to write a book, they don't start a publishing company to do it. <laughs> but, but that was Carol to a T. And, and she really had no idea what she was doing, but she did a tremendous job at it anyway. So that, that was sort of my introduction to, to Carol Guthrie. Yeah, that's a great story. You know, it's interesting because we've, we've only had two occasions in our probably close to 30 now Glacier Book Club books to, um, to do books by um, non-living authors. The other was Mary Roberts Reinhardt, who also was quite a horsewoman, who also decided to start a publishing company. Um, so, you know, it's very interesting. In that case, her grandson, Rick, um, was, our, was our guest in that one. Um, so, you know, as we talk, Ann and, and Will and, and for everybody, they, they very much want for this to be a discussion. So please populate some, some questions in the chat. I know we have some already. And Amy, I'm going to turn to you uh, in just a minute. I'm going to reserve some time with Will a little later on. He uh, also sent us a, a photograph of a really interesting document for which there's a backstory. I can't wait to get to that. Um, and I also want to feed into... Um, uh, uh, the book clubbers. Um, I'm going to ask more of you tonight than I usually do. Um, and I, I want to want to uh, sweeten the pot because I'm going to give away a very special book given to us by a very special friend of Glacier's. Uh, this is a, 
coffee table book by Larry Lynn, Dr. Larry Lynn Peterson. It is a, a John Ferry uh, book, The Painter of Glacier. Um, and we'd love to send one of those out to, uh, to a lucky winner tonight. Um, so that will be chosen at random, but um, I'm gonna ask a question to each of you. And um, if you feel like you um, would like to answer with your story, just say, I've got an answer to Doug's question and we'll call on you here soon. Um, and the question or prompt is this, the early in the um, early in the story, we, we have um, uh, Frank in uh, Germany where he grew up doing button bouncing, bouncing buttons off the wall and whoever gets closest to the line gets all the buttons. Um, it reminded me as a kid, I mean, we were always playing games like that as a kid. And so my prompt is, is there a game for you when you were growing up that you remember in that way, in that special way that Frank uh, remembers um, button bouncing? So just put in the chat that you have an answer to that and we'll we'll uh, call you and unmute you. Um, and with that, Amy, I wonder if you might uh, help us walk through some of the early questions. Yeah, for sure. Um, welcome to book club, everyone. Um, of course, Carl and Candy are getting us started off tonight, um, and they commented that they love this book, especially chapter six, and they wanted to know if Frank's cabin at Mount Stanton was still standing, um, and can we get to it and see it? Will or Ann, do you know the answer to that? I don't know if it's the McDonald, uh, Lake McDonald Ranger Station or not. I was going to actually follow up on that and see if that was the original ranger station, but I don't know for sure. I, I did note in the book and to that point, because I had the same curiosity um, that when they transferred that to the park in the book, they began referring it to it as the Lake McDonald station, which mm -hmm. would lead me to believe that it is, if it's not the same actual structure, I think it was that same location because of course the Wheeler cabin is to one side and then private property of Clack Evergreen is on the other side. So um, it did have a dock in the photo in the book, which of course the dock was burned um, in a fire some years ago, but- um, um, I was I'll, gonna I'll... take the photo of the station and, and go up there and hold it up and see if it looked like the same structure. I'll, I'll volunteer to go with you, that'd be- a, Okay, be a... <laughs> or we can check in the archives. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Great question. I think, I think Candy's raising her hand. She wants to go as well. <laughs> okay. Me too. <laughs> I have a, a I have a quick anecdote about a ranger station, about Carol and First Rangers in it, and it's a quick one, but um uh I I think it speaks to her connection she would have with the people she wrote about and, and how she, they just came, became a part of her. And recently I had a conversation with Kathy Springmeyer who used to be the publication director at Far Country Press. And she had a, a very special day with Carol only a few weeks before Carol died. And Kathy was up in Trego, Montana at her family cabin, or Kathy was up there at her family cabin and Carol wanted to come meet her there. And the reason was she wanted to check out Aunt Flats where uh, Herrig had built the ranger station and the barn and the corral. So they went and they walked the grounds, they peeked in the windows of the cabin, it is the original, and they walked the, nature trail nearby and it made Carol very happy to know that these buildings were being taken care of and in really good shape so I I think she wrote that book so many years ago yet she still wanted to get, get up there and see that property and I think she and Frank um, or yeah they had or Fred Herrig they had a little conversation together and uh, maybe it was a completion for her to actually see the site that she had written about. So that, that ranger station does still exist. Nice, thanks for sharing that, Anne. That's Super a great story. And uh, when you see Kathy uh, next, tell her that um, I said hello, their son Clay and our sons were very close friends. <laughs> Good. 
Amy, you've got along those same lines. I was just going to add that Carl and Candy wanted to know if Lulu's childhood home in Columbia Falls is still standing. Not sure. I have no idea. No, unfortunately. So, and I think I uh, I think uh, reflect on your ranger station. I believe the archives at at um, in Nebraska, University of Nebraska, the um, first building out there. If you know where the ranger station is, behind there, there's a bunkhouse or a fire guard cabin. And just off of there, I, I believe the archaeological study that was done um, quite back in the 50s there, and that site is almost... Um, there was some question that the road that was built in there went right by it or through it. And um, uh, actually, I think Don Robinson even had some pictures of the old ranger station. And we had one in that office up there. So something um, that the ranger station that we presently know uh, I don't think they want to live that close to the lake, but it, uh, as modern times came, they did. Um, uh, I think the information uh, primarily on the Wheelers, the National Park Service Ranger Station, the Clarks and Clacks, that was pretty well completed. And there's a whole lot, a lot of archives about those properties and others at uh, most of the archaeology for the national parks in the northern rockies has been done out of the university at lincoln at the university there and much of uh, our archives i believe is still at the university from glacier national park thanks marshall and marshall knows what he's talking about i think was it 55 marshall when you first started uh, your first national park service job in uh, glacier <laughs> That's about right. My father transferred in 1953 from uh, Rocky Mountain National Park to um, Glacier. And I found this book to be quite exciting, um, though um, uh, those names would come up in our interpretive talks, but I didn't ever know in depth. And I... Um, uh, remember talking to Don Robinson. There was another person out of California that had known some uh, uh, of the early people that transferred from the Forest Service over to the Park Service. And uh, so that was always interesting. Um, I um, I think I've walked, we used to have over a thousand miles of trail in Glacier, and I think I put in a hole there. I was a trail foreman and later a ranger. But um, I, I think these are exciting books to put out. Um, and I'll end here. Somebody, the sign that they were looking for wives, I always thought if I was a writer, is how the influence uh, since 1910 to fairly recent times, wives really had an effect. In fact, I, my mother, and, and and including my wife, if we left, uh, they were put on as GS3s and they could um, give out power permits or whatever came along, and including, uh, and there's better stories than that. My wife, when I was at Polebridge, had to put together a rescue of a lady who had been mauled up on Bowman Lake. So yeah, if one of you are author and stuff, I'd certainly look at the wives um, living in a government quarters, uh, park headquarters and other places. Um, it, um, it, it was a compound and you most of the time I talk about it was a dream. But I want to tell you, isolation of children in the park service at that time was somewhat of a problem. We weren't out. I'll end it there. I've talked too long. Well, Marshall, thank you, and thanks for your service. Uh, many, many years with the Park Service, including as the uh, Deputy Superintendent, Assistant Superintendent at Grand Teton, 
So thanks for your for your service to to this work. Um, I'm going to call on uh, two people, Nora Gray, which might be Nora or Randy, and then Ed Wilson said they had answers to my questions. Nora slash Randy, do you want to start? Sure. It's Nora. Randy. Hey, Nora. I, uh, it, it, whoops. No, I did it. You're good. Oh. Unmute. How's that? Hey. The game I remember is playing jacks. I mean, it was fast and you'd go over the corral and under the fence and into the barn. I don't know how many of you played jacks. Anybody? It's mainly a girl's game, but you know, it was so, I, that'd be bounce the buttons for me. It's like, wow, did we have fun doing that? Yeah. All right, that's awesome. Ed Wilson, you got your uh, bags packed for Montana? I do. Can't wait to see you next week. Atta boy. The game we played in elementary school, I think we called it pitching pennies and all the kids who could hide from the teachers would take a coin, usually a penny, and you would throw it up to the wall and whoever got closest to the wall would get to take all of the other pennies. So uh, I enjoyed playing jacks too, but I don't remember you could win money playing jacks. <laughs> Uh, Carl and Candy offered hopscotch, and uh, uh, and Judy said tiddlywinks. Does anybody else remember a game involving baseball cards? Because um, that was my thing, and it, I, you you'd throw your baseball card, and it had to overlap with another person's baseball card, and then whichever ones you overlapped, you got to take. Oh, um, and so you had to really decide which ones you were going to throw because it, you know, if it's a Mickey Mantle, this could get very serious very quickly. <laughs> oh, that's great. Amy, Doug, I think you got I, to... I, I played that game, uh, but only once. And and partly because I'd inherited my my brother's baseball card collection. He was nine years older than I was. So he had very valuable cards <laughs> of, of all the top players, uh, even prior to World War II. Um, so yeah, I, I learned my lesson the first go around and that's... quit playing that one. That's a that's an important lesson. And we yes. another legend we lost just this past week, Chuck Johnson, dear friend to many of us, um, uh, collected baseball cards. In fact, uh, owned every baseball card of every player um, during his entire lifetime. Um, Chuck, Chuck will be missed. Um, Amy, I think you have some more questions. This is fabulous. So this is fabulous. Um, I have another uh, where can we see question from Carl and Candy. Uh, can can we see Frank's animal collection that he gave to Glacier National Park in 1952. Do you know about that, Anne? As far as I know, they his collection is still in the collection. But I haven't been working in the archives for quite some time. I doubt if they've been deaccessioned. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm going to sneak in here again, and I'm going to try my technical skills. Um, uh oh, I've done myself some sort of a disservice. Andrew, I'm going to ask you if you might to uh, put up the picture that Will sent us. Will, you were kind enough to send us a photograph from, um, I, I, well, I'll let you tell the story. <laughs> I, I love this, uh, this whole story, actually. Um, so in the original edition, um, Carol had written that, that you know, both Fred and Frank came over uh, to the, to America from Germany, and and Frank's story in particular, um, she said that that uh, he came across uh, on on a boat called the SS Lenzin, L E N S S I N. And when I first read that, I kind of flagged it. Um, part of my job as an editor is is to do fact checking, and so I'm I'm always kind of on high alert for things that that just don't look right or sound right, and that was one of them. But I didn't check into it right away. Um, so eventually, when I I went back through it before I I sent my edits to Carol, uh, I, I looked at it again, and I I thought that just doesn't ring true. And I, I sent a query, I emailed a query to Carol to say, are you sure about the, the ship name? 
And she said that it was a name that she'd found in records from Ellis Island. It bothered her that she couldn't find any other information on the SS Lenzen. Um, but, but bear in mind, she was writing the original edition in 1995. And so uh, the internet wasn't quite what it is today. Um, so we, we uh, puzzled it a bit and, and couldn't come up with a better answer. And I finally just decided to go digging uh, through Google. Um, and I, I ended up uh, finding this, this scan. Um, it's, and, and I should explain that my family, before I was born, my, my, my father was a career army officer and he was stationed in Germany for six years. Uh, with the family. So my, my brother and sister spent six years in Germany. And then I came along and found out that in my family, if you wanted to understand what, what my brother and sister were talking about, uh, especially when they didn't want my parents to understand, you had to speak the speak secret language and it turned out to be German. So I ended up uh, sort of learning German and then actually uh, took it through high school and, and college as well. So when I found the scan, I, right away, I saw the resikness and I knew that meant register. Um, and, and I realized this was, I, I'd done a search for uh, Francis Liebig and, and here was the ship's register of the passengers. And I did find his name. It's not actually on this photograph, but um, I found his name and it was, he was clearly on this ship. So I had to try and decipher the, the rest of the calligraphy. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, this is an actual photo of the handwritten in fountain pen um, passenger register for the ship. And some of the facts matched. I saw that it said captain and Carloa is the name and that's the name Carol had in the book. Uh, you, you can pretty easily make out New York. Um, you can see uh, Abgang des Schiffes means the departure of the ship. And that was on the 26th, or sorry, 22nd of September in 1895, that matched. The one thing I couldn't figure out was I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm seeing damp Schiffe, which means steamship. And I couldn't read the, the handwriting there. And it, I, the more I looked at it, the, the more I thought it looks like lens. And <laughs> you can kind of see L-E-N-S-S-I-N there at the, it's right under, it's sort of sandwiched between the two New Yorks. And, and I, I, I finally decided to treat it, uh, treat the rest of the register like the Rosetta Stone. And so I looked at other words, other handwritten words uh, throughout the register and gradually sort of started to decipher the, the alphabet. And eventually I realized that there were two S's in that ship's name, but they were followed by an I and not an N, but an A. So now I had SSIA. And then I realized that the second letter after the, the big uh, initial cap letter at the start, the second letter was an R, not an E. And then, and then I realized the next letter was a U. <laughs> and suddenly I had blank Russia, which didn't make a lot of sense. But I, I felt at this point like I was playing uh, a Wheel of Fortune. And, and Eventually, I was able to kind of pull back and, and see through the overlap, and then it made total sense that the first letter was a P. So it's the SS Prussia, which made complete sense um, sailing from Germany. Um, Frank, Frank was Prussian to begin with, <laughs> uh, and, and arriving in New York on the 22nd of September. Uh, but, but it was... a. a fairly involved process that probably took more time than my my boss would be pleased with since time is money. But but I thought it was worthwhile. And and I was really tickled to find the name. And and then of course I Googled the ship's name, SS Prussia, and found all sorts of information. And yes, indeed it had sailed um, and arrived at that, at that date, uh, and, and it made complete sense. Everything suddenly clicked. 
So I, I uh, emailed Carol and sent her the scan. And I think she was even more excited than I was that we had actually found the, the, the right ship name that we fixed. A, it wasn't really an error. It was just the best information she had at the time. Um, but, but that we were able to, to actually get it corrected and, and accurate. Um, and that was, it sort of ties into Anne's story about going to see Ant Flats uh, Ranger Station. Um, you know, bear in mind, this is uh, 20, probably about 2018, um, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 2018, 2017, maybe when, when I was uh, finding this information and, and conveying it to Carol. And she was still uh, that dedicated to getting the information right, to, to telling the story accurately. And she was just thrilled. I think she was also just happy that somebody else cared as much as she did about it. That's really, really a cool story. Thanks for, for sharing that with us. And, you know, that kind of individual kind of really original research right that's that's the core of of history and of, and of history writing and and to be right. able to to find that original document is really um is really something well we we i know we're going to have a, some more questions as well great great memory uh, uh from uh gail and joel uh from uh Kerry, north carolina um mumbly peg that's another that's another uh, you know, game that um, maybe our parents didn't know we played as much as we did at the bus stop. So um, I'm going to launch another book club or question. I know you're not acclimated to my being so uh, so needy here with with you guys, but um, I, I when I looked at tonight's roster between you, you've come to 599 book clubs in the last two and a half years since uh, the beginning of our uh, beloved pandemic. So thank you for that. It's been such a treat to spend time with you and. Um, another kind of just a prompt, is there a story like this for you? You know, I was very taken by um, the story of Lulu and the missing thimbles of, I think it was Clara Gilbertson. You'll remember late in the book, Clara has come over to sew. She has a beloved thimble that has some initials and dates on it. I'm forgetting exactly what. And it gets lost. And 50 years hence, um, it's discovered at Lake McDonald and eventually delivered back to to Clara, are there is there a thimble in your life, right? Is there a story of um, of a of a late discovery of something or a return of something in your life? So think about that, and if you have an answer, just again pop in the chat that you have an answer um, to that question, and we'll get to it. I also noticed that Ray Duff joined us. Ray, it's great to see you as always. Um, I have your book right on the top of my desc. Um, it's a fabulous one. Uh, a view with a room, um, and again. Um, this is something, uh, Will, that you guys helped uh, launch at Far Country. Yeah, we, we actually, we do a fair number of books on Glacier and particularly on, on Glacier history. Um, and, and that particular book uh, is uh, one of our better sellers. Uh, it's really interesting about, about the historic chalets and hotels. Um, most people, when they think of the chalets and hotels and in Glacier now, they think of the ones that are there uh, still, but but there were more. Um, there, were, there were many other chalets in particular, and and I, I think Ray did a terrific job um, explaining that and and uh, going into the history of those places uh, and and really the history of Great Northern um, building the many of the the chalets and hotels in the first place, um, bringing tourists from across the country on the train. Uh, we have a, a sort of a similar book <clears throat> by Christine Barnes um, uh, about Glacier Park Lodge in East Glacier and uh, goes into the history with, with some great uh, historic photographs and, and others. Um, so both of those books really talk about the, uh, the railroad and the, the development of the park um, through that particular sort of historic lands. Yeah, it's really an, it's really an important park, you know, it, um, important part of the park. When I got this job in 2017 and the, the early fall, uh, my board just said, you know, nothing's going to happen. It's August, September, nothing happens in the park around here. You may remember that there was a bit of a fire that uh, took out the Sperry Chalet. So 
uh, my greeting to Glacier was rather abrupt and very much related to a very quick ramping up of my history of the importance of uh, the chalets to um, the very fabric of of kind of Glacier National Park and its founding and the railroads and all those all those kinds of things really very interesting. Um, so Amy, I know we've got some more questions in the chat. I'll turn it back over to you um, and uh, and see what you got. All right. Well, Judy um, wanted to know if uh, this might be for you, Anne. You have any idea what was Frank's favorite place in Glacier? I don't know from reading the book. Um, probably the entire landscape. <laughs> I, I would say uh, it's possibly anywhere where there were wildflowers blooming. He was a huge uh, wildflower fanatic, um, knew both the common names and the, the scientific names, uh, binomials. Um, so I'm sure that I can imagine him crossing a meadow and and stopping, you know, it, it might, he could probably out hike anyone and yet it might take him hours to cross a meadow just because he's stopping to look at all of the, the flowers. As he says in, as in the book, to stop and say hello to his friends. True. I, I was taken by that section. I think it was Don Bunger or Bunger who's quoted at length about that. I, I just, yes. I, I thought that was such an interesting way. I've always wondered why you remember certain things and you can't remember other things. And this idea that you you treat those things as friends is really, really uh, that's not something I'd ever heard before. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. So Andrew, um, I think you have a thimble story for us. Yes, this is, uh, well, it's not my personal story, but my friend, um, Doug Follett, who maybe uh, a lot of you have encountered over the years, uh, he worked in Glacier um, for a really, really long time, um, retired at, at 94, I think, a year or two ago. Um, he would tell me um, that he used to lead tours up to Sperry Glacier. And um, in like the 1980s, he dropped a piton into a deep crevasse in the glacier when he was uh, leading a tour around like you know, 30 feet down into the the black and uh, he was never going to see it again. And um, a few decades later, uh, one of the chalet employees came up to him and they said, Doug, I, I got your piton. And the glacier had melted back so far that this uh, giant crevasse was like completely gone and there was, uh, it was just sitting on the bedrock. So he was around long enough to see like the landscape totally change around him and um, uh, got that little piece of metal that he dropped back eventually. Wow, that's absolutely astonishing. We do have a winner uh, and my dear friends Ming, Bing and Mary Ewalt in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania were selected for this. I have the strange feeling that I may have already sent you a copy of this. So we will negotiate Bing, Mary uh, and I. Uh, about that. And um, if so, we'll get it out to another um, lucky winner. Now, I, I pre-warned Will and Anne about our speed round. Um, and uh, so we're tonight, we're going to truncate it a little bit. We have two sets of three questions. Um, Anne's are going to be glacier related. And the way this rolls is I'll give you a category and then a choice of two things within that category. And you choose one of them. Um, and we'll go back and forth um, here, wills are going to be Helena spe specific. So got a couple of Helena people here. Uh, Andrew Annenberg, uh, for example, thank you for all the work you do on our trail system, Nordic track. So you feel free to weigh in on the chat as well. All right. And Will, I'm going to start with you. Very simple one. The, the subject is craft beer in Helena. And you have two choices, Blackfoot River Brewing or Lewis and Clark. I know there's there's I think there's at least five or six craft breweries now in town. So I, I have to say all of the above, <laughs> all of the above. OK, that, that's very good. I, I think uh, Will has just announced his candidacy for mayor of Helena. <laughs> well, watch out, Wilmot. Um, OK, and again, Glacier gen in general, um, this is a toughie. It's kind of like choosing between your children. Um, but the, the, the topic is favorite side of the park, east side or west side? 
That's not fair. <laughs> You're just going to say Logan Pass? <laughs> I like that answer. Okay. Yes, Logan. <laughs> You know, um, George Bristol, whom I think uh, many of you know, um, uh, also a very confident writer, I'm sure when he shows up at the archives, it's a similar feeling. Um, he says it this way. He says, the, the big thing about Glacier is the whole thing. And, and I think that's really a nicely put. So, OK, that's the right answer, both. All right, back to you, Will. Um, we've had, I think, a, what is an emerging um, competition in Helena? Um, the topic is fresh bread, uh, and your choices are the emerging sunflower bakery on the west side of town or the Park Avenue bakery. I'm, I'm sorry, but I have to go with my son's homemade bread. Okay, all right, very good. I... <laughs> uh, for fresh bread, baked bread. Um, all right, we'll, we'll take that. Um, okay, Ann, this is really book, this is book related. Favorite first ranger, Fred or Frank? Oh. <laughs> oh, I can't choose a favorite. It's grueling, think, isn't no, it? No, I don't think Carol had a favorite. Okay, you're going to just go Lulu? <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Well, we're not getting very definitive answers here, but that's okay. No, we're I, not. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm on one of the Sunday morning news programs, but, but uh, you know. That, that may be my next year. Okay, last question. This one I know you'll have an opinion on, Will. I know you're a trails guy. This The subject is Helena Trails. Um, peak grabbing, we going Mount Helena or Mount Ascension? Uh, this one's easy. I, I lived for, my, my first house in Helena was on that south central side, uh, up, up at the base of Mount Ascension. And, and uh, Mount Ascension was the first of the two that I climbed cleanly without putting a foot down in one fell swoop on my mountain bike. So yes, Mount Ascension. Mount Ascension, and that is in fact the correct answer. Very good, well done. <laughs> um, okay, so Anne, it's early season. We're looking for that easy to get to west side hike. Are you gonna go Huckleberry Ridge or Apgar Lookout? Probably Huckleberry Apgar. Ridge or Apgar Lookout. They're both south facing. So yeah. um, hence early with snow, yeah. But but the the Huckleberry Ridge, you there's a pretty treacherous snowfield that lingers. So I'd probably go Apgar. Apgar lookout. All right. And if those of you who do not regularly check in to the glacier webcams, which and thank you all for the support you give us at the Conservancy. Um, we support those webcams. The Apgar Lookout webcam has been spectacular the last few days. I really encourage people to. To look at that so okay well thank you for indulging me um in uh in the speed round um i i appreciate it um amy you got any other uh last minute questions in there in the chat i don't see any more questions i do see our very own margaret notley uh, um also had a story of something she lost and is hoping to find find do you want to oh, share good. margaret Yeah, I keep I've started mentioning this more often just on the off chance that someone actually can make it come back to me. I don't have a Glacier Conservancy name tag. I know where it is, though. And it was this fantastic donor event we had in, in the Wheeler cabin. Terry Tempest Williams was reading from a, a recent book and there was this magical moment where she was talking about bats and what she'd written. And just at that moment, a bat starts circling around inside the cabin. But anyway, my name tag fell down behind the baseboard. So I know where it is, but I just can't predict when it's going to come back to me, but I remain convinced that one fine day it will. So there you go, that's that story. That, then we'll be doing some work. One of the projects um, and the legislature actually has a hearing on Friday. We were fortunate enough to be selected for a $493,200 Montana Historic Preservation Grant to restore the historic Burton K and Lulu Wheeler cabin. And interestingly, Ann, I was just uh, exchanging emails with Monica today um, yeah, about hosting an event um, with the fellow who wrote the seminal Wheeler biography, who was an earlier guest of ours, uh, Mark Johnson, who in September is going to be again in Montana, 15th and 16th. And Monica uh, is going to host an event um, with us at the uh, Montana House. He's going to sign his new book, 
which is um, uh, bipartisan giants of the Senate, Mike Mansfield and Everett Dirksen. So that will be uh, that will be very fun. That's so um, yeah, so that'll be a, that'll be a great event. Um, I wanted to kind of um, you know it's it's rare that we have two such such acclaimed kind of participants in the literary world with us who um, who are you know writers in their own right, but also participate in other places. So give us a little insight, um, and I'll start with you, Will. What's on your bookshelf right now? What are you reading? I actually got hooked uh, into uh, Walter Isaacson. Um, somebody handed me a copy of his The Code Breaker uh, about Jennifer Doudna, the, the Nobel Prize winning uh, scientist who sort of figured out uh, how CRISPR would work and, and do gene editing. Um, and, and then uh, I realized Isaacson had written a number of other books on, on uh, scientists. So I I went down to Aunt Bonnie's and used up some of my, you can imagine as an editor, uh, I have a lot of books sitting around. So uh, that means I have a lot of credit at Aunt Bonnie's used bookstore. <laughs> and I used it to, to uh, get uh, Isaacson's biography on uh, Einstein and then also on um, uh, Da Vinci? Uh, da Vinci and then um, Ben Franklin. I just finished Ben Franklin. Nice. Nice. So, That's awesome. Yeah. And what about you? Well, on top of my stack, I've got uh, back in Montana. Dan told me my Montana quarterly uh, came, which I read that cover to cover. And, uh, and then uh, someone gave me Michael Ober's book for my birthday on the historic places all over Montana. And I'm working my way through that one and I wanna visit each and every one of them. That's, yeah, well, and it's a big state, you know, it uh, takes a little time yeah. to do that, but uh, all 56 counties, it's a, it's a, it's a diverse place to, to live. Um, so I also had, um, before we go, since we have a minute, there was a request um, and Gail and Joel, you may have to unmute for this one. There was a request for a description of Mumbly Peg. <laughs> okay, so Mumbly Peg was played with a pocket knife, which you could carry to school at that time, <laughs> or at least when I went. But you started out with your two feet together, like you were standing at attention in the military or something like that. And you took your pocket knife and you would throw it down towards your foot and stick it in the ground. And wherever you stuck it in the ground, you'd move your foot out. And then you'd, the next time, and you were playing against another person. So they would throw and, and move on, move on. If you didn't stick in the ground, you lost. If you did stick it in the ground, you moved and he made the same move. Then you would throw on the other side and you keep going until you get your feet spread so far out, you either fall over or you can't throw again. Okay, well, I, I think this is the point um, at which we say, do not try this at home. Um, but I remember <laughs> playing, I remember playing this as a kid. Um, I wasn't sure I remember the rules. Will? In, in my version, <laughs> Uh, you didn't throw it at your own feet. You threw the knife at your opponent's feet and vice versa. It was a much riskier game. <laughs> much, much, much riskier proposition at that juncture. Well, there you go. So, yeah, that's um, that's pretty amazing. Thank you so much uh, for uh, for all these great this great discussion tonight. It's just been terrific. Um, uh, Anne and Will, thank you for taking time out of your schedules and from a birthday celebration and, and a, a trip uh, to California and Will um, from Shoveling Snow uh, in Helena. We, we have a couple of events coming up. I'll just let you know about and, and we'll put those in the chat as well. Um, we have some spots still available for the April 26th Glacier Conversation with uh, Road Supervisor Brian Paul is going to talk to us about all the work that goes into getting Glacier open, particularly uh, the snow plowing, et cetera, on the Going to the Sun Road something you won't want to miss. Um, uh, we, we probably have close to 200 people, I think, already um, for that. And then our May book club uh, is with Michael Punk. Many of you will know Michael from a number of great books, uh, including The Revenant and um, 
uh, uh, Fire and Brimstone, the Story of the Butte Mining Disaster. He'll be with us with his book about um, uh, the restoration of bison or the saving of bison, George Bird Grinnell. Um, his book is, is, um, uh, is of course called Last Stand. Um, that will be May 17th. Um, and we're hoping that that will be able to be a hybrid event. Uh, Michael uh, is open to doing something in person in Missoula. So it will be Zoom as always, and you can sign up for that. We'll send out the link, uh, we'll open uh, now. And then um, uh, we will, if we are able to launch an in-person event and you're in the area and can make it, we'll be certain to do that too. Um, so two fun things coming up, April and May. Uh, put those on your calendars. Look forward to seeing you all. Um, Anne and Will, can't thank you enough. Um, thanks so much for your really time. Fun. And, and thank you for all you guys do for Glacier. You know, it, it really, you, you've spent a lifetime caring about the outdoors and uh, in general and specifically this place. And it, it, uh, it makes a powerful difference. You know, for the first time this year, we were able to fund $3 million worth of projects in the park. Um, and it didn't happen overnight. We, we stand on the shoulders of giants like Doug Follett and, and others and, and you, Ann and Dan, and um, so many who have led the way to being able to make this kind of an impact. Put that another way, that increases the park's operating $15 million operating budget by 20%. So if you think what you do, sending a check for 10 or $20 or participating in a community conversation that encourages people to action, um, it matters um, in, a, in a big way. So again, thanks everybody for a wonderful evening together. Um, we we'll look forward to seeing you all soon and um, and travel safely home and we'll all see you. I'll buy you a beer at your favorite establishment next time I'm in town. Sounds good.